So my name's um, Andy Sharrox. I work in life sciences in the university. I'm Dr. Anthony Adamson and I'm an experimental officer in the transgenic unit. CRISPR is a, a system which has been derived from a bacterial source. It consists of two elements. There's the RNA element and there's a protein element. Essentially CRISPR, um, the very lay explanation, is a bacterial immune system. But in the context of what we do, it has been repurposed to uh, modify mammalian cells or any other kind of cells as well uh, to make whatever modifications we'd like to do. The big revelation with CRISPR-Cas9 is all of a sudden it's based on RNA guiding uh, a, a protein to a certain site of the genome and that RNA is very, very easy to build in the lab and pretty much anyone can do it now. Technic's only two years old now. Um, and since that time, virtually every single project in the lab now uses the technique. Uh, so it's extremely versatile, it's extremely quick and um, relatively easy to do compared to other genome editing techniques. A whole variety of techniques we can use to um, um, generate our model systems but it seems that a lot of the techniques are being minimised and we are doing more and more CRISPR-Cas9 and the demand is really increasing within the university. Particularly important to change genomes and regulate them because if you're going to firstly investigate anything biological you need to test it in the context of the natural cell in which it's operating our organism and you can do this now uh, very easily. So you can introduce point mutations, you can remove genes, you can add genes, you can change your expression subtly or in large amounts, so you can mimic cancer. Uh, phenotypes for example very easily, you can change crops very easily. The system is extremely useful, um, it continues to be developed, um, it's been developed at a fast pace, uh, there are new tools available almost on a weekly and a monthly basis. As I said CRISPR can be used in a whole um, range of different organisms, so it can be used in plants, it can be used in, uh, so the agricultural industry could be interested, you can make you know, uh, rice grow faster or taller. Uh, and of course, on top of that, you've got, always got the therapeutics question as well. Can we actually treat genetic disorders and genetic disease in the long term? Which, you know, to be honest, it will happen in the next 10 to 15 years or so. Um, the ethical issues are almost the same as for any other type of genetic engineering. Um, so it's the same issues of creating new organisms. Um, one of the problems is if you go too quickly uh, with new technologies, you don't understand the limitations, the side effects, then there can be problems downstream which we can't anticipate yet. Several years ago, I think it was 1975, uh, there was a, a very large meeting where draft concerns were written out as what potential experiments could be done in the future. And at the time, they, these were very much science fiction. They were not going to be around anytime soon. People were postulating, oh yeah, human germline editing, it won't happen for 100 years, 150 years or so. And it's actually happened a lot sooner. Than, so now, um, all of a sudden, the ethical concerns are back on the agenda and really need to be discussed. Um, people are talking about it as being the biggest thing in science since PCR was invented back in the early 1980s. And I, I, I tend to agree with that. Um, essentially at the moment in time, it looks like the sky's the limit of what we can actually do. 